So today we're carrying on with uh, lecture number 18. So we're still talking about reinforcement learning. And now we really get into the ways that we can start solving problems, which are uh, Monte Carlo methods. And this is chapter 5 in the reinforcement learning textbook. I don't know if anyone has looked at that textbook yet, but it's, it's quite good. And uh, I recommend having a look at that before the exam because it goes into a lot more details about some things and it can really expand your knowledge on some of the topics. So again, the topics that will be on the exam are only the things that are in the slides, but the extra explanation in the textbook can definitely help you um, to understand things a bit better, I believe. So there's the, there's the chapter that this is covering. So we're talking about uh, Monte Carlo methods. And Monte Carlo methods are not just confined to reinforcement learning. We see Monte Carlo methods all over the place um, in computer science. And they are methods for estimating um, value functions and discovering optimal policies within the reinforcement learning framework. So wherever you may have seen Monte Carlo methods before, this is what they're going to be doing for us in reinforcement learning. And uh, a good thing about uh, Monte Carlo methods is that unlike dynamic programming, we do not need um, to assume that we have a complete model of the environment or even complete knowledge of what's going on in the environment. Um, they can just experience things and record states, actions, and rewards and learn about them without a model. And so Monte Carlo methods require only experience. Um, so that would be a, a sequence of states, actions, and rewards from either an actual environment or a simulated environment. What do I mean by actual versus simulated? Well, let's just say actual would be something in the real world. So you could have a real robot walking around that actually uses these methods to, um, to, to learn policies to accomplish particular tasks. So an actual experience would be a physical robot, maybe sort of how a human learns, that sort of thing. Um, and learning from actual experience, meaning not in a computer simulation, means that, well, we don't have a model of that environment to use, but that's OK because Monte Carlo methods do not actually require a model of the environment in order to do the learning. So we don't need to know the dynamics, the physics formulas, the layout, or the, even the full state space of the environment. We just do things, we record how we did with those things, and then we learn from that. And so what's going to happen is the agent is going to take an action, carry it out, and get a reward from the environment, and then we'll see how we're going to do some math to, uh, to record the actions that we want to keep doing. Um, the simulated experience, in contrast to actual experience, would be some sort of video game or simulation that we've written to simulate a particular environment. You know, if we wanted to do something involving space exploration, well, maybe we don't have Elon Musk money to go build a spaceship, so we would write some sort of simulation to do that for us. And learning from simulated experience is also very powerful because, again, we don't need to know how the model works all we really need to have is the state transition function. Meaning, as long as we have some sort of simulation that takes us from one state, allows us to do an action, and then get to the next state, for example, any video game, right? then we don't need to know how the game engine works. We don't need to have the source code of the game engine. If we did, of course, it would help us because we could run it a bit faster. But we just need this experience, right? We can just say, OK, I'm at this, I'm in this position in this Mario level, I said jump, what was the reward from that? And I don't need the actual source code of the game. So it doesn't need to know all of the action and state probability distributions, whereas something like dynamic programming does. And so this is where the power of reinforcement learning really starts to kick in once we don't uh, need a model of the environment anymore. But Monte Carlo methods are used for a lot more than just reinforcement learning. So I want to just give a couple of slides on Monte Carlo methods and why they're called that and what they actually do. So Monte Carlo methods use sampling. So sampling, um, typically we use random sampling in Monte Carlo methods. And the reason it's called Monte Carlo methods is because Monte Carlo is a very famous place known for its casinos. And there's lots of randomness going on in those casinos, right? So Monte Carlo methods, uh, here's one example. There's a website down here you can click on to go play with this. And it's a Monte Carlo sampling method used to estimate the value of pi. So you might say, OK, how can we use randomness to estimate such an exact irrational number? Well, let's look at this. We've got this square over here. And the way we've set up the square is that it has side lengths 1. So the area of this square is going to be 1. Um, inside, circumscribed inside that, um, or inscribed, 
Inscribed, yeah, circumscribed means on, its, on the outside. So inscribed within that square is a circle. And if the diameter, meaning the side length, is 1, that, that means the radius of that circle is 0.5. Okay? And so the square's area is just 1 times 1, length times width, so that's just 1. And the circle's area is pi r squared, which is pi over 4, right? Because half squared is, is uh, divided by 4. And so what we can do is, let's just write a program that's going to generate uniform random numbers within that square. And so what happens is we keep generating random numbers, more and more random numbers. And then what we can do is we can tell whether or not the point that we generated is inside the circle or outside the circle. How can we tell that? Well, we know the radius and we know the location of the middle of the circle, so we can just use the distance formula. So we generate a bunch of, um, generate a bunch of points. We know the area of the square and we know the area of the circle. So we can use the ratio of the number of points that were randomly put inside the circle to tell the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square. Right? So what we can do then is estimate pi. So pi over 4 is approximately the ratio between the number of points inside the circle to the number of total points that we generate. So just like we can, we can know, OK, the the area of the square is this ratio to the area of the circle, then if we uniformly, randomly generate points in that area, the number of points inside um, versus the number of points outside is related to pi in this way. So pi is approximately equal to four times the number of points inside the circle divided by the total number of points. And if we actually run this simulation, this is what this ends up looking like. And as we get more and more and more points generated, um, our value gets closer and closer to pi. So I think that's really cool. Um, and you can use this for so many other things. Here's, a, here's one other area where you can do this. And again, this is related to areas. There are not all Monte Carlo sampling methods have you taking ratios of areas, but I just thought these were nice visual examples. And so what you can do, uh, another thing, which is even more complex in my opinion, is estimating the area under a curve or under a function or taking the integral of that function, right? So what we do is we're going to, again, uh, over here, the, the example we have, we have this rectangle. So this rectangle goes from some x um, to some other x value. So that's the input range. And then we've got f of x or y, which is the value of the function. And so as we know, an integral, the area is the area under the curve. Um, integrated between this x and this x. But how are we going to figure out the area under the curve? Well, um, again, we're going to generate randomized points with, uh, within that area. And then when we generate a random point, we know its x value and we know its y value. right? So I'm going to plug that x value into the function to get the y value of the function at that point. And then I will know whether or not this um, random point that I've generated is below or above the curve, right? So in just the same way, the area of the ratio of, a, of the points below or above the curve can tell us how many are below, and we know the total area of that rectangle so we can figure out the area of, of the integral. And of course, this is never going to give you the exact analytical numerical solution, but it's going to give you an approximation of that solution, right? So Monte Carlo methods use sampling to give you an approximation of a solution to a hard problem in which other ways to solve it may not exist. Now, of course, there are other ways to solve um, for the value of pi, and there are other ways to find the value of integrals. These are just nicely illustrated examples. And so in this example, this is what happens. And so we, get, uh, we have the function. We have the points that we like underneath the curve, and we have the points that we don't like above the curve, and we find the ratio of those, and then we know the total area, and so we can calculate the area under the curve. And this is also um, a nice illustrated example of that as well. So it's pretty neat. Monte Carlo methods are, are nice. I like them. Um, and they're able to use this same sort of sampling method to solve reinforcement learning problems as well. So it learns based on averaging sample returns. And so we're going to generate a bunch of samples. We're going to see the rewards. We're going to sum up those rewards to get our returns. And then we're going to average those returns over so many plays. 
And um, we're going to be discussing Monte Carlo methods for episodic tasks. Um, I think that's where they make the most sense. And so this is where our, all of our experience is divided into these finite episodes and all of our episodes eventually terminate. So the algorithm that I'll be giving for Monte Carlo methods for solving RL is only going to work for these episodic tasks because it requires summing up everything for a particular episode and if the episode doesn't end then this, this method won't work. And so um, value estimates and policy updates are performed only at the end of an episode. So, so far we've been talking about, okay, you know, you take an action, you get the reward, you update your belief, then you get a new policy, you take an action. But in this one, we're going to take a bunch of actions to, to generate an entire episode, and then at the end of the episode, that's when we're going to do our update. Um, so Monte Carlo methods sample and average returns for each state action pair, just like we did with bandit algorithms. Um, and they're going to tra essentially treat each state as a bandit algorithm. And because each of those bandit um, problems are related, meaning that you know my state, all the action values at this state are kind of related to the next state, um, the reason they're related is because the actions and the rewards that I get at this state are probably related to the ones around me. So the goal of Monte Carlo prediction is to learn the state values for a given policy. So let's try and do that. Um, the value of a state, remember that's v pi of s that we looked at last time, that's the expected return. So the sum of discounted rewards starting from the state. And so let's just think about this. The intuitive way that Monte Carlo methods are going to work is first we're going to carry out an episode using a given policy. So we talked before about just doing a single action, but again we're going to do uh, an entire episode. And I'm going to do an illustrated example of all of this in a bit. We're going to record all the states that we visited in the episode, and then average the returns after visiting the states in that episode, and then update the value estimate of the state with the averages that we've found so far. So that's essentially what Monte Carlo's, Monte Carlo methods are going to do, and this converges to the expected value over time. So it will converge to the true values of those states if we take enough, um, if we take enough samples. So just a, a quick syntax note from the previous, because I know I'm using the word value here a lot. Uh, the value is the expected return from a specific situation, either state or state action pair. So v pi of s is the expected return starting in state s and following policy pi. And q pi of s a is um, the expected return after we've taken an action at a particular state. And this is the one that we're more interested in, q pi of s a, because um, this will let us know when we're at a particular state, okay, look at all the QSAs and see the action that, um, that maximizes the value, and then we can take that and update our policy. So I'm going to use the example of blackjack. Who here has played blackjack before or knows the rules of blackjack? Anyone? Okay, we've got one gambler. All our gamblers skipped out on class today because I know there's a few. But don't worry, I'm going to go over the rules of blackjack. I'm going to assign homework to you to somehow, either online on some free website or with a deck of cards, play a few hands of blackjack, please. Because there may be a question on the exam using blackjack as an example. And once you've played a couple of hands, you're like, oh, OK, it's pretty easy. That's how it works. But I'm going to try and explain it up here on, on the screen. So blackjack's, blackjack is a game that's played in hands. A lot of card games are played in hands, but in blackjack, the hands are truly independent. Okay, so I'm going to make a bet. We're going to play one hand, and then depending on how that hand, if I win or lose or draw, I'm going to win or lose or keep my money. Okay, so the reward at in a hand or an episode of blackjack, and an episode of blackjack is going to be playing of different cards. Every action is going to be zero until the terminal state, because nothing that I do matters until I actually win or I actually lose, right? So I'm only going to get a reward at uh, the terminal state. Or I'm going to get a reward at every state, but only a non-zero reward at the terminal state. If I win the hand, I'm going to get a plus one reward. So I'm just assuming that my bet is $1. So I bet $1. If I win, I get $2, meaning I've gained a dollar. Therefore, it's plus one. If I bet $1 and I lose, I don't get my dollar back, so I've lost a dollar. And there's going to be a reward of zero um, if, if I draw, 
because you can get the same number and you don't win or lose anything. There's one other case in blackjack where it's a special case where if you get dealt a 10 and an ace, it's called a blackjack, and you just get plus 1.5. So you get a little bit of a bonus if you get really lucky. So here's what a game of um, blackjack looks like. You are playing the game against the dealer. The dealer is employed by the casino, right? So this is not a game um, where you can play it against a friend. Um, the, the person you're playing against is just a, um, a static policy that never changes that's against the casino. So picture there's a game like rolling dice, and if you choose to play, you give the casino $10, and you roll some dice, and based on the outcome of that, you win or lose money. That's kind of what blackjack is like. It's, you're not playing against another person. I'm, if we are both playing blackjack, we're both playing it against the dealer. And if you actually go into a casino, because they want to make as much money as possible and have as many people playing at a time, you may see one dealer playing against up to eight people at the same time. right? But that is quite literally eight individual games going on. What you do in your game has absolutely nothing to do with what I do in my game. Because the number that the dealer gets and the number that I get determine the payoff. So essentially what's going to happen is a bunch of cards are dealt out. The dealer gets some cards. We sum those values. I get some cards. I sum those values. And the highest number closest to 21 without going over 21 is the winner. Okay, so blackjack is also called 21s in some places um, because of that. So what's going to happen at the beginning of the game is that the cards are shuffled, they're randomized, and then two cards are dealt to the dealer and two cards are dealt to the player. And again, if there's multiple players, they're just multiple independent games. They quite literally have nothing to do with each other. It's just the casino trying to make more money. So the dealer gets two cards. One of them is face up and one of them is face down. So this is all you get to see as the player until you are finished taking all of your actions. And so sort of the drama or the excitement of blackjack comes into the fact that you don't know one of the cards of the dealer, right? So the dealer, um, again, in blackjack we're concerned with the sum of the numbers of the cards. So you can see a four. So the cards in a standard deck go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, and king. All four of those are all worth ten. And then an ace is worth 11, or 1. It's like if you go over, an ace can be worth 1 instead of 11. So it's good to have aces. But you don't know the sum of your dealer's cards so far, right? They could have anywhere from 6 up to 15. You don't know that. Then, um, so yeah, one of the cards is hidden. And then I get dealt my cards. And so I, get, I might get dealt these cards, and I know I got lazy and I took the same cards, so that's fine, it's still legal. So I currently have a sum of seven, right? Because I've added three and four. If it was a three and a queen, I would have 13. So I have a sum of seven, and the dealer has a four. And again, the whole point is that my actions in this game are that I can choose to stop and get no more cards, or I can choose to get another card. And so getting another card is good because my sum goes up, but getting another card is risky because I could go over 21. And if any player goes over 21, they instantaneously lose, no matter what happens to the dealer. Okay? So here, I'm in no danger because there are no cards that I could get to make me go over 21. Right? So the starting state here is uh, state 0. The player has a total of 7, and the dealer has a 4. Now, I know that the dealer has something else, but all the information that I have, the only, only the things that I can observe show me the state. Right? So the state now is I have 7 and the dealer has a 4. And every action that I take is going to just be based on the dealer having a 4. So let's keep going. So the state now is uh, I'm just recording it as my sum and the dealer's card. So that's state 0. Now, my actions... Now, in an actual game of blackjack in a casino, there will be more actions like than this. There's something called splitting, where if you have two of the same card, you can actually separate them into two individualized hands. But, and there's also something called doubling down, where I can double my bet and just get one more card. But we're going to keep it the very simple version of blackjack. So my only actions in this simplified version of blackjack is I say, hit me, which doesn't mean punch me in the face. <laughs> 
it means give me another card, right? So the way you indicate this is you either say hit me or you tap on the table and the dealer will give you another card. Or I can say stand, which means no more, no more cards, okay? So hit me gives me another card, stand means no more card. The hand ends when either I say stand or I bust, meaning I have more than 21 points. So if I keep asking for cards and then I hit stand, then what happens is my actions are over and then the dealer follows a fixed policy. And the dealer is almost not even a player in this. It's just the environment, right? It's just a roll of the dice. So what's going to happen is the dealer is going to get um, the dealer's policy. It will, okay, the first thing that's going to happen is the dealer is going to actually flip over the card. They could literally have anything. And the dealer's policy that the casino forces him to do, or he gets fired, or he or she gets fired, is that they have to keep getting new cards until they have 17 or more. That is the optimal policy for the dealer, and so there was no reason for the dealer to deviate from that policy. Okay? So let's, let's, let's play out a hand and see what happens. So right now, if I have seven and the dealer has four, I'm just going to choose to hit for illustrative purposes. Right? This is probably what you should actually do in a real game, but we're not talking about optimal policies yet. I'm just giving you an example. So this is chosen from some policy pie, and the policy is just in my brain. Right? Or I've been given a little betting sheet which tells me what to do. So I'm going to choose to hit, and the state is now updated. Right? So I transition from the state where I have 7 to where I have 9. Okay? So now the state 1, after the first action, is I have 9 and the dealer has 4. And since the game is not over yet, I get a reward of 0. So I haven't won or I haven't lost, so my reward is just 0. This is an episode. I only get my reward at the end of the episode. So here is the current situation. I have nine, and the dealer has four. So let's choose to hit again. This is my action one. So I, action zero was hit. Action one is hit. Now I get a five. OK, so I had nine. I add five. Now I have 14. So now I'm in state two of this episode, where I have 14. And the dealer still has four. Because remember, the dealer doesn't do anything until I'm done with my actions. So again, my reward is zero because the game hasn't ended yet. So I'm going to choose to hit again, and I'm going to get one more card. Now this is where it starts to get dangerous, right? Because I have 14. If I get uh, 8, 9, or 10, then I'm going to instantaneously lose. But luckily, I'm in control of this example, so I get a six. That's really lucky because now I have 20. 20 is very close to 21, right? So if you can do math, you can probably see that I'm not going to get another card now, because any card other than an ace is going to make me instantaneously lose this game. So usually, if you get 18, 17, 18, 19, 20, you just stop, right? You don't want to keep betting, because your chances are so high that you're just going to get one more card and bust. So my reward, again, was zero, because I haven't won or lost yet. And then I'm going to choose to stand. And so at this point, the hand is essentially over, because there are no more actions to be taken. The only thing that happens now is sort of the dice roll of the environment that gives the dealer its sum. So the dealer's policy is fixed. The dealer has to hit until they get uh, 17 or higher. right? And the funny thing is, the dealer has to do that no matter what. So if I had 14, and then I stopped at 14, if the dealer had 16, technically, they could stop and win, because they have a higher sum. But they are literally not allowed to do that. They have to go to 17 or higher. That is the blessing and the curse of the dealer, right? Is that they have to go to 17 or higher. So here, what's going to happen this time? Well, the dealer got dealt a 3, which was, um, oh, so they had a 5. So they have nine, um, 9 total with their first two cards. Then they got dealt a 3, so that goes to 12. And then, since it's under 17, they had to hit again, and so they got a king, which is worth 10. So now the dealer has 22, and if anyone gets 22 or more, then they instantaneously lose. So the player has won this round of blackjack. Okay? Now, the player won that round of blackjack, but maybe the dealer got a 9. This is what happens to me whenever I play blackjack, right? And the dealer got 21, which is the highest number you can get which is higher than 20, and so now I've transitioned to the state where I lose. Oh, let me just quickly mention that 
it doesn't matter which winning state you get to, right? If I have 20 and they have 17, or if I have 18 and they have busted, all of those are essentially the same state. It's just the state where I win, because it doesn't matter which state I win at. There's no difference in the winning states. So this was, um, I forgot to say that the final state is, is the winning state, and the reward that I got from winning was one. Okay, so that's what happened in this case. But if the dealer had gotten lucky and gotten a nine, then they would have 21, and then I would be in the losing state, and my reward would be negative one. Or the only other possibility is that the dealer got an eight, and this is called a push or a draw, where I am in the draw state, meaning that nobody has won, so I just get the money back that I bet. Okay, so those are the three outcomes for a hand of blackjack. And so it's a really conceptually simple game to play. And if you as the player play the game optimally, like actually optimally, then the, the way that they have designed this game is that the dealer is going to win about 52% of hands, and you are going to win about 48% of hands. Okay, so over time, the dealer is winning 2% more than you are, or they have a 2% edge. And so if you play, that might not sound like a lot, but over millions and millions of hands of blackjack that are played every day, that amounts to a lot of money. There's a reason why casinos play this game, and it's because they win. And now, you'll hear some people have like these magical systems for blackjack, where, oh, my policy can actually win, no, it can't, right? Anyone who tells you that they can win at blackjack is lying, or they're doing something which casinos think is cheating. It's called counting cards. So counting cards, it has nothing to do with our lecture. I just like talking about it because I'm a big nerd for this sort of thing. Counting cards is when you can remember what cards are left in the deck, okay? So if you can somehow come up with a system to know, for example, if we go back here, um, where the dealer had 12, for example. The dealer has to bet until they get 17, no matter what. They cannot stop betting until they get 17. That's the actual policy. So if you could somehow know that the only cards left in the deck are all 10s, or 9s and 10s, like the majority of the cards left in the deck are very high cards, then you as a player will actually win more often than you will lose. Because since the dealer has to keep going to 17, if all the cards left are really high, then that means they'll bust way more often. So if you go in there, and if, the, if they're playing in the casino with one deck of cards, what people do, there's like very simple card counting systems where it's like, okay, if any card was dealt was a seven or less, it's minus one. If the, the card was dealt that was eight or more, it's plus one. So you just keep this running sum in your head. And if you think about it, okay, if the sum is really negative, it means that a lot of small cards were played, so the only cards left are large cards. So what you do is, it does not actually affect your policy. It doesn't affect how you play the game, but what it does affect is now I might have a 55% chance of winning, so I'm gonna bet more money. So what card counters do is they sit down at a table and they bet $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, and then they finally say, okay, now the count is really good, there are only high cards left in the deck, I bet $10,000, right? So it doesn't affect how you play, it just affects how much you win. And so if you go to a casino and you do this, where you bet $1, $1, $1, and then you bet $10,000, they instantaneously kick you out of the casino for card counting. Because they think math is cheating, right? So, what the casinos do to get around this and still have a winning game is they don't play with one deck of cards. They play with, at minimum, eight decks of cards that are all shuffled together. And what that does is it makes it much harder to know what the next cards are, right? And if you play online, then, you know, who knows what, what algorithm they're using to cheat online, right? So, you can only really trust physical cards, and the casinos do whatever they can to make sure that they have the edge on you and not vice versa. So blackjack in a standard casino is an unwinnable game over, you know, as T goes to infinity. Now, it's about 50-50, so you could go in and, like, place a big bet and win, but then leave, 
right? Because you've won. And statistically, you're going to lose. So if you are ever up money, you should leave. But it's harder, it's easier said than done to just leave when you're at a blackjack table. Anyway, so if anyone tells you they have a winning system for blackjack, then that means they are either lying or foolish or they are card counting in a way that the dealer cannot, the, the casino can't detect, right? Maybe they have some glasses with a camera that keeps track of the count, but they'll be kicked out and their thumbs will be broken if that actually happens. Okay, enough blackjack, back to the reinforcement learning. Okay, so let's look numerically at what just happened in this hand. Um, so the player got dealt a four and a three, and the dealer was showing a four. We didn't know what the other card was, but it doesn't matter. Because if we don't know what it is, we have to keep playing the same way no matter what it is, right? You are going to find an optimal policy for the dealer showing a four. Sometimes it's going to be a 10, sometimes it's going to be a 3, but all that randomness will be worked out by the Monte Carlo method. It takes all that randomness into account and just finds the best thing to do on average. So state 0, I have 7, the dealer has 4. Action 0 was me hitting to get another card, I got a 2. And my reward was 0 because we don't get rewards until the end of the episode. State 1, since I got a 2, 7 plus 2 is 9, so that's, episode, uh, that's state 9-4. Um, action 1 was hit, I got a 5, I got a reward of 0 again. 5 plus 9 is 14, so state 2 um, is 14 for action 2 was hit again, I got a 6, I still have a reward of 0 because the game wasn't over yet. And then at state 24, my action is stand. So at this point, the dealer does its thing, and then I get a reward of 1 because I won. I, I get a reward of negative 1 if I lost, or 0 if I had drawn. But in this case, I get a 1. So state 4, then, was win, and that's the terminal state of the episode. That's when I get my reward. So the state sequence, so this is the state sequence of that episode, or hand of blackjack, was 7-4, 9-4, 14-4, 24-4, win. Okay, so that's the state sequence. The action sequence was hit, 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 stand. Now maybe if you're programming a blackjack game, you may encode those as integers, so maybe hitting is 1, standing is 0, so that's like 1, 1, 1, 0. The reward sequence for that episode was 0, 0, 0, and then 1. And the last thing that I want to look at is this future return sum. What does the future return sum mean? It means that for every action that I did, what was the sum of all of the future rewards from that point, right? So 0, 0, 0, 1, well, the sum of all the rewards from this point is 1. The sum of all the rewards from this point is 1. From this point, is, so it just happens to be all 1s for this case, right? So this is my future return sum. Now, given this state sequence, this action sequence, and the reward sequence that I got, what I'm going to do is update my QPy of SA value estimates for taking a particular action at a particular state, right? So I'm going to say, okay, my reward for that episode was one because that I won that episode. So intuitively, what's happening is really simple. I play out a hand of blackjack, and whenever I was at a state, I took a particular action. If I won that hand of blackjack, then in the future, I'm going to take that same action at those same states. But if I lost, then in the future, I'm going to be less likely to take those actions at those same states. And over millions and millions and millions of plays, as this averages out, I'm going to figure out what action, on average, is best to do at a particular state. So for Q741, 1 is the action of hitting, then my, I'm going to do that update. Right? So the update was one of just keeping an average. It was the, um, uh, so there was the average one, there was recording, there was the incremental average, and then there was a fixed size alpha incremental update. There's all sorts of ways that I could do this update. But essentially, whatever my belief of that was, now I'm updating it to be closer to 1. Right? So the, the value of hitting when I have 7 and the dealer has 4 should be closer to 1 than whatever it was on the, last, on the last step. So if it was 0, and we're using fixed size alpha uh, of 0.5, 
then the new value of hitting at 7.4 is going to be 0.5. And if it happens again, then it's going to be halfway between 0.5 and 1, which is 0.75. So as you keep winning with actions, it keeps getting closer to 1. As you keep losing with actions, it gets closer to 0, or it gets closer to negative 1. And so that's what we do. For each of the state action pairs that we visited in that episode, we update our belief to be closer to the reward that we got from that episode. It's pretty, it's pretty intuitively simple, but it does involve a little bit of math. And if we wanted to keep track of the values of states, then we could just say, OK, the value of that state gets updated as well. But typically, we do want the state action pairs. And so in practice, we won't be using just state values. So here is the algorithm for that. Um, this is called every visit Monte Carlo prediction. Um, what every visit means is that, um, I'm not sure if I have a slide on this, but I'll just explain it now. Let's say that I'm doing a pathfinder. So in blackjack, we actually cannot visit the same state twice because our sum keeps going up, right? So we're always going to be visiting different states in a single episode of blackjack. But think of a pathfinding example. I could move up, left, down, right, and then I'm back at the, the original state. Right? So in some cases, I can visit the same state twice. And there's going to be two different algorithms that I show. One is called every visit Monte Carlo, and one is called first visit Monte Carlo. And you saw down here, we want to update the state action pair with the value that we got. Every visit Monte Carlo is going to say every time we visited that state action pair, update the value. So if I visited it three times, update the value three times. But it turns out that theoretically, you actually, what you actually want to do is only update it for the first time you visit it. Right? Because it doesn't matter that you saw it three times in the same, in the same episode. You still kind of just want to do that um, update once. So what this means is, if I had another 741 later on, then every visit Monte Carlo would update it again. First visit Monte Carlo would only update it the first time that I see it in the episode. And they just have slightly different theoretical properties of convergence and stuff. So every visit Monte Carlo, of course, we need to take in an initial policy, pi, to do our actions with. So QSA is our initial value um, beliefs uh, for each state action pair. Maybe they're just zero. Maybe someone has told me something. They're, you know, maybe they could be random. Um, and what I'm going to do in this example is that just keep the average. So I'm going to keep a, a, a list of all the returns that I got. So this is not the incremental update. This is just keeping all the returns for each state action pair. And then while true just means play however many hands of blackjack that we want to train for. So generate an episode with this policy. So that's state action reward, state action reward up until the terminal state. Then I've intentionally skipped a line here, which I'll come back to. And then for each time step in that episode, so for each state action pair that we visited in that episode, um, G, that's the return. So I'm going to sum the rewards that I got from this state to the end of the episode. Then I append that return to the end of returns. And then Q of STAT is just going to be the average of those returns. Okay. So that's literally it. Just generate an episode, calculate the return that I got from each state action pair, and then set my new value for that state action pair to be the average of all the returns that I got. So if I won a bunch of money playing blackjack um, with this policy, I'm going to have a bunch of high values. If I lost, then I'm going to have a bunch of low values. So for example, as we keep playing and keep playing, if the state is I have 20, then the value of me hitting is going to be very low, because I'm going to lose a bunch. But the value of me sticking is going to be very high, and because I'm going to win a bunch from that state. So this is every visit Monte Carlo prediction. And um, oh, I did have a slide on this. What am I saying on this slide? OK, so I've already said that. That's just the slide on first visit versus every visit, so I don't need to say that again. Um, yeah, OK. So I'll just skip those because I already said it. Um, but you can use that for studying purposes. So this is every visit Monte Carlo. And to change this into first visit Monte Carlo, 
literally all we have to do is keep track of the state action pairs that we've visited, and if we've already visited, then skip it. That's it, right? So it's the same algorithm, we just do it for the first time we visited a state action pair instead of all of them. Um, so you may ask, what about that cool algorithm we learned about last time, which was dynamic programming? Why can't we use that to solve blackjack? Well, we could, but there's a caveat. It'd be very difficult to compute values for blackjack using dynamic, program dynamic programming, even though we have the model. It's trivial to program a simulator for blackjack. I have the complete model, but for dynamic programming, we are required to know the distribution of the next events, the rewards, everything. Remember the Bellman equation? We needed to know the probability of taking an action A at state S getting us to the next state. So for example, at state 13, 7, if I choose the action of stick, what's the probability of terminating with a reward of plus one? I need to know that for dynamic programming. And so what it's saying is in order to use dynamic programming, I need to know what the probability of me winning with this action is. If I know the probability of me winning with the action, I've already solved the problem. I just take the one with the highest probability of me winning. So there's no point to use dynamic programming because I'd need to know this thing, which is hard to calculate. So I'd need to solve blackjack first in order to solve it using dynamic programming. And so those probabilities must be known prior to dynamic programming. And so especially in games with randomness or complex rules like blackjack, it's hard to use dynamic programming. It's much better if it's like, OK, I take the action up. Now I'm up, rather than this could be any card, it could take me to a winning state or not, et cetera. The cool thing about Monte Carlo is it does not need any of that. It doesn't even need to know how the game works. It just says, I was at a state, I took an action, and I did good or bad, and I update my values. That's it. So now that we have those state values or the state action pair values, how do we form a policy? Well, you already know this. We, just, we can take greedy. Right? We can take the one that maximizes it. So without a model, we can't tell which actions lead to other states using samples. And so we actually have to calculate the value of doing an action. So we need the QSAs, not just the VSs. And so QSA is the expected return when following, uh, was starting in state S, taking an action, and then following that policy. And so um, this, you know, if we have QSA, we look over all the A's, and then our policy on the next uh, time step is just going to be, hey, maybe take, take the one that's, that's the highest, right? And then this whole process repeats. Now, let me talk about exploration for a second. Because for a lot of problems, the number of states and actions is actually quite large. Very, very large. Um, blackjack is one of the smaller problems that we'll ever see. So if we follow a given policy, we're going to be encountering the same type of states over and over and over and over again, right? Um, think of a game like chess. We always start in the same position in a game of chess. And because you are decent players at chess, you know, okay, I probably won't start the game by moving my leftmost pawn. Maybe I'll move one of my center pawns, or something like that. And so if our policy says, okay, move the pawn up, that's going to be a decent move. And so it will, it will follow the first few moves maybe the same time every game, and it won't explore enough to know what happens if I do move that piece over there, right? I need to have tried that a bunch in order to assign it a negative value to not actually do it. So we must be careful to explore, to choose actions at states that haven't been done before, right? If all I do is I keep winning and winning and winning, then I'm not learning about any other states. So this is one of the problems with, with reinforcement learning and machine learning in general, um, is that so here, here's an example that illustrates this. There have been a number of reinforcement learning-based and um, supervised learning-based agents that were trained on like expert human chess games, right? So you look at the hum what the humans did, you use reinforcement learning or some form of um, neural net or other type of machine learning to learn what good humans do. But the problem is that system, yes, it does produce an agent that is good at playing against other expert humans. But what has happened is that if the only training data you used was on this small set of states where human experts play, and then you play against someone like me who's really bad at chess, and I start getting it into states that it's never seen before, it has no idea what to do and will essentially just start taking like random actions. 
And this has happened before. Um, I think it happened in AlphaGo, which we'll talk about later. There was, there was like a situation that it had just never encountered, and it had no idea how to play from that situation, and it made a big blunder and then ended up losing a game when it should have probably won. It was in a winning state, but it had never encountered that type of state before because it didn't do enough exploration because the game of Go is, is too large. So what this is saying is um, explore the space as much as possible and make sure that you're sampling from all the states and all the actions. So now that we have values for state action pairs, how do we update the policy? Well, just remember the bandit action selection. Um, we've seen how to estimate values given that we follow a fixed policy. Now how do we update it to perform better over time? Well, as we learn the values of QSA, we can learn a policy that approximates the, the optimal policy. And so this is called policy iteration. And it's basically the, the big algorithm that most of at least tabular reinforcement learning uses. So once we have a value estimate, then we update our policy incrementally over time. And so this is called generalized policy iteration. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to maintain an estimate of my current value function and my current policy estimate. So I have two things. I have my values and I have my policy. And the value function is going to be repeatedly updated to more closely resemble the true value function. And what this means just says, as I get more and more samples, my esti get, estimate gets more and more correct. Right? It gets closer to the true value function. And then, as my value function gets closer and closer to the true value function, then me taking the best action from those values gets closer and closer to the optimal policy. Because if I had the true values, I just choose greedy and I have the optimal policy. And so the value function is repeatedly updated to be more accurate and then the policy is repeatedly improved based on that. So policy iteration consists of these two main processes. One, policy evaluation. So you make the value function more closely estimate the, the value of the current policy. So I have a policy, I do some number of episodes with it, I update my values, I'm getting closer and closer to the true value of that policy. Then, once I know the true value of this policy, I can make changes to the policy to make it better and better. So policy iteration is making the policy greedy with respect to the current value function. And so in policy iteration, these two processes alternate. And so um, we do policy evaluation. It could be for one time step. It could be for a whole episode. Depending on the method, it varies. So we evaluate the policy. And then we look at how we evaluated the policy and do our um, policy iteration, which is updating the policy to be greedy with respect to those. So policy evaluation, policy iteration, policy evaluation, policy iteration. And so generalized policy iteration, um, that is the idea of letting this process one and process two interact to, for, to improve a policy over time. And almost all reinforcement learning methods resemble this process somehow. And over time, two things are going to happen, as I've already alluded to. One is that the values approach the true values. So what we think the values are are going to approach what the actual values are. And then the policy is going to approach the optimal policy. Um, and when this process stabilizes, meaning no changes, um, then the process has completed. So we can you know, do this for a million time steps or do it until we have found that our policy is no longer being updated. Um, because things have stabilized probably toward the optimal policy. So what we can see over here is that the evaluation step takes our policy and updates the values, right? So we, um, we perform an episode or we perform a number of time steps and update based on the rewards that we got. Then when we have those values, we take our policy to be, to be greedy with respect to those values and we update the policy. Down here, this is a nice little diagram where we start somewhere in the space of all possible values and all possible policies. And then as we update the value, we go here. And so the value is going to approach the true value of the policy, and the policy is approaching, is, is getting, sorry. The value is going to be updated with respect to the policy, and then the policy is going to be updated with respect to the values. And so one update, our values get closer to the real values, then our policy gets closer to optimal then our values get tr closer to the true values, our policy gets closer to optimal, and hopefully, eventually, we converge towards the true values and the true policy. So how do we apply policy iteration with Monte Carlo methods? 
Um, well, we already looked at this. Policy evaluation, we just update the value, episode, value estimates after each episode, and then update the policy after based on the new values. So we have new values, go over, make them greedy. And so this iterative process, if we look at it linearly, we start with an initial policy, we evaluate it. Then we have values um, that we think that policy is associated with. Then we improve the policy based on the values. Then we evaluate that new policy. Then we get new values. We, you know, I don't need to keep saying this over and over again. And then the, pol the policy at a state just looks over all the possible actions that we can do at that state and takes the maximum um, value. So here's the algorithm. You could all write this by now. Um, you start with some initial value estimates. Let's just set them all to zero for simplicity. We start with some initially equiprobable random policy. So we just start doing random things. And then while true, generate an episode. Then um, we update our value estimates based on the episode returns. And we update our policy um, to be greedy with respect to those. And that's it. So Q estimates the true values, and P estimates the optimal policy over time. And if we do this for blackjack, hopefully what we get out, if we visualize it nicely, is something like this. So for this very simplified game of blackjack, where all we can do is hit or stand, this is the optimal thing you can do. That's it. So in this simplified version of blackjack, I think the player has about a 45% chance of winning. The increased complexity of the new rules of doubling down and splitting, et cetera, are actually beneficial to the player and bring that up to about 48%. Um, I had one student come to me once and said, oh, I implemented this, because the project, as we'll see, is, is implementing blackjack, essentially. And said, my algorithm, I can beat the computer. I found a policy that beats the computer. I'm like, no, you didn't. And, I was like, and he's like, so sure that he had found it, and he's going to go to a casino and, or play online or something. And I was like, if you have found a new policy that beats blackjack, then every casino in the world is out of, is out of business, right? And so it turned out, yep, just had like a semicolon in the wrong place or something and fixed it and then found, okay, now I'm actually matching, matching this. So it's cool to go out and do it yourself. Like, that's what is nice about science and algorithms, computer science, is you don't just have to take my word for this. I'm not just some preacher, right? You can implement this and solve a game. It's really cool. At least I find it cool. Um, and people keep come on, coming up to me like, and asking for stuff like career advice. Like, you know, if I go, go to apply for a job and someone else applies for a job, how am I going to be the one who gets the job? Well, do something like this. Add it to your portfolio. You know, if two people have the exact same everything, but one person solved blackjack and you're applying for some AI job, you know, that's probably a good thing to have. Right? Why not have that on your resume or in your portfolio? Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about exploring starts. So many problems has very large state spaces, as I said before. I should actually move these slides back to where they were. So many state action pairs will not often be visited. We just won't get to them. Okay? Um, so what you should do is, when generating episodes, vary the starting states, if possible, to ensure that they all get sampled. And this is called exploring starts. So if we think about it, there are things in blackjack, for example, yes, I get dealt two starting cards, right? But it turns out when you deal someone two random cards, or let's actually use the rolling of two dice. Let's say we roll two dice, and then the sum of those dice is the starting state. If you know anything about dice rolling, then the sum that you can get in two dice that have six numbers, you can get a sum of 2 to 12. But the chances of you getting 2 and 12 are far less than you getting 7. Right? It actually follows a normal distribution. So if you have something like that where you have some of the starting states are very unlikely to happen, like in blackjack, me getting two twos is very unlikely. So if I play 100,000 hands, I might only visit the 2-2 two two state a dozen times. So I haven't learned much about it. So what you could do in something like blackjack is instead of starting the game by dealing the cards randomly and getting a normal distribution over the starting states, just generate all the possible starting states and start from there so that you now you have a uniform distribution over the starting states. So you've learned about everything equally well. Now, OK, some people will say, yeah, but if your actual game does have a normal distribution, then when you actually play the game, you are going to be encountering a normal distribution, 
So shouldn't you be learning about that normal distribution? Right? Sure, but now there are other states that you just haven't visited. So this is just, you know, you can use exploring starts. Um, so if you learn about chess, try learning from a randomized boarding, board position in chess, right? Maybe something like that. So Monte Carlo ES, all returns for all SA pairs are simply accumulated and averaged, and Monte Carlo with exploring starts cannot converge to any suboptimal policy. That's a good thing to say. So if it does converge, then that's to an optimal policy. Because if it did converge to a suboptimal policy, then the value function would plummet. And if the value function goes down, then you would start taking the other actions that have higher values. And when you do, then you converge to the optimal policy. So it's just like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If the values go down, you're always going to eventually figure out what's best and do the thing that's best. So convergence to the optimal policy is sort of intuitively inevitable, but it's, it's not like completely proven, and I wouldn't even want to try and prove it in this course. So in practice, Monte Carlo with exploring starts converges slowly, because even though we are saying the starting states are evenly distributed, in practice, not enough states get visited. So what we can do is also, while we're generating the episodes, don't always just follow the policy. Because if you just follow the policy and you just do greedy, then we could get stuck in a local optima, right? And so you can also do what we did before with exploration in Monte Carlo. So we could use something like Exelon Greedy when we're doing Monte Carlo to ensure that, OK, I'm trying all the actions at all the states to learn as much as I can. And so by including not only exploring starts, but some randomized actions, then more states get visited, more actions get sampled, and we learn more quickly over time. So as a quick overview, Monte Carlo methods use sampling to generate episodes, um, which are of the form state, action, and rewards. The value function is estimated at the end of the episode via rewards that were obtained. The policy is updated to reflect the estimates, so evaluation, update, evaluation, update. New episodes are generated with the updated policy. And varying the starting states and action selection can help you visit more states and converge to the optimal policy. The very last thing that I have is this YouTube video. Um, it's <laughs> Menace, the pile of matchboxes which can learn. But I'm not going to show that on the slides because I don't want to just like freeboot this person's YouTube video that they worked really hard on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump now to talk about the project so that that can be on the video. And then I'll come back and play a few minutes of this video uh, in class, but I'll cut that off of the recording. So I'm going to stop. Oh, and exam questions that there could be. Uh, what's the definition of Monte Carlo methods? The algorithms we talked about, VS versus QSA. Um, I could give you some samples, and you would have to perform a Monte Carlo um, um, calculation. Explain exploring starts, the definition of GPI, and anything that appears in that Menace video, which is reasonable. So the Menace video, like it has people's names and stuff in it. I'm not going to ask you what was the name of the woman standing in the background of the video. But anything in that video related to machine learning and how it worked is what I could ask you on an exam. So before we watch a couple of minutes of that video, I'll go back over here and I'll talk about the course project details. So I posted this last week, but I figured, hey, I should probably talk about it in class a little bit. So I'll just read this and, and see if I've said anything wrong. As previously mentioned in class, this course will have an optional bonus project that you can do in order to increase your grade in the course. The project is worth up to a bonus of 10% of the year, which will be added to whatever grade you get at the end of the course without the project included. So if you do the project, you cannot do worse than if you had not done the project. So the project does not get inserted into your grading scheme and make everything else worth less. It is literally a bonus. Okay? So someone said something like, OK, if I'm getting 100% in the course and I get a 10% in the project, does that mean now I have a 91% in the course? No. You cannot do worse from doing the project. It is strictly bonus material. So if the project grade would put your grade above 95%, then it would be capped at 95%. The project is not meant for people with 98s to get 100. Okay? To get 100 in my course, you've got to get everything right. And if you didn't get everything right, you don't get the 100. Sorry. 
So it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not meant to get 100, but it's meant for you know, people who want to learn and get a little bit, little bit more grade, or for people who may not quite be at that 65% that you need in order to stay in grad school or pass the course or whatever that you're desperate to get. So someone who's at like a you know, high 50s or low 60s can do the project rather than come to my office and just beg for, for extra grades. The project is going to be due on the last day of exams, so I'm giving as much time as possible to do it. Um, you do not need to email me and say that you are thinking of doing the project. I'll just look in the Dropbox at midnight on that day, and whatever's there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grade. There will be absolutely no late submissions for the final project. Okay, So if it's a minute late, you should have submitted a long time ago. You've got a month from now to do this project. Do not wait until the last hour to submit it and chance being late. I'm downloading it at the... This is like two days before I had to have grades in to the registrar. So I cannot be waiting for late assignments and I can't be giving second chances. This is just a bonus. So don't, don't try and take advantage of that. The project must be done solo with no partner. This sounds a little bit harsh, but this is a chance for someone to really demonstrate that they learned something and they deserve the bonus marks. It is not another chance for someone to carry you to a, to a, to a grade in the course. Okay? That was what the assignments did. I know, there are, you know there's differing levels of skill in the class, and sometimes there's one really strong programmer who helps the other person out through all the assignments. But because this is complete, just bonus marks, I want this to be a solo effort. The project should be about as much coding as assignment two overall, plus there will be a document. So I'm just giving you a heads up of how much, you know, you could do this in a week if you worked really hard and you had nothing else to do. I'm, I'm sure of that. I think everyone is capable of doing that. The only thing, I'll, no, I'll talk about that when I get to the thing. If this seems like a lot of work, blah, 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 blah. OK, so I already talked about that. Uh, all the details of the project can be found here. So I just want to go over this really quick. Uh, so this is the final, um, final project due 11.59 PM. The final project of the course will be to implement both Q-Learning and Monte Carlo to learn an optimal policy for the game of blackjack and compare the results of both methods. So we have not talked about um, assignment 5 yet, but assignment 5 is going to be implementing Q-learning in the grid world pathfinding. So if you choose to do the project, you've already gotten the Q-learning algorithm done. It's, it's like 10 lines of code. Q-learning is not the hard part of the project. You will have to implement Monte Carlo, and essentially what you're going to do is you're going to apply both algorithms to blackjack, and you're going to see what differences there may have been? Did one converge faster than the other? It's like an exploration of this to show me that, OK, I really wanted these extra marks, and I've, I've learned independently somehow in order to get those grades. Um, you can use the, any assignment that I've given you so far as the starting point for this assignment. So you can take assignment 5 and use it for the UI. One thing that is different about this is that um, you do have to modify the user interface. So I do want to see, as you're learning, the blackjack policy changing over time. So you are going to have to edit that JavaScript and the drawing of the HTML canvas a little bit. So that may take you a day or two to get used to, but that's, that's what I want. Um, it must be implemented in JavaScript and HTML like all the other assignments in the course. So just continue on with what you're doing. You must write a new user interface that visualizes the blackjack policy as it learns over time. So just like the single iteration functionality from A5, you must have a button which plays a hand of blackjack and updates the values and policies for one episode. You must also have a toggle iteration. So basically what I'm saying is assignment 5 is 90% of the work for you. Okay? It's just that where before we had arrows pointing to which grid cell you should move to, now what I want to see is the value of the blackjack hand. So it's really not that bad. You just take the grid that I have there and you draw different stuff in it. All the controls and stuff you should be able to reuse. And so the policy must look something like this. And this goes to, um, like this. So that's what I want to see in the end is like a blackjack policy um, that looks like that. 
The project must, uh, should be, okay, I already said that. You must implement the following rules of blackjack, so you don't need to, you have to implement, you have to program blackjack, like the dealing of a card from a deck, et cetera. It's not that bad. Take you an evening probably to do that. Um, you can assume an infinite deck of cards to deal from. That makes it much easier. So if you were to say, okay, I'm dealing from one deck of cards, then you have to have a set of cards that you choose randomly from and take it out of that container and add it to the player's hand. But in this one, you can just literally generate any of the random 13 cards. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. Just generate one. It comes from an infinite pool of cards. So you don't need to worry about um, implementing decks. You must implement hit, stand, and double down. So if you're doing this, just look up what double down means. You must properly implement an ace being an 11 or a 1, depending on the situation. So in blackjack, if I have a 5 and an ace, my total is 16. But then if I get a 10, that would be 26. But each ace allows it to be an 11 or a 1. So if your sum with an ace would put it above 21, you treat it as a 1. So that would be 16 rather than that. But then if you get another 10, now you're busting. Okay, so you've got, to, you've got to implement that. You do not have to implement uh, splitting or insurance, which are rules in more complicated versions of blackjacks. You will, not lo you will lose marks for any of those features not implemented that I said here. Your policy must converge to the standard blackjack optimal policy. So if I go back here, your policy doesn't have to be exactly like this. But it should show that you're hitting up in this corner when the dealer has higher cards, and you're sticking down in this corner when the dealer has lower cards. Right? Because that's the general policy of blackjack. Um, the project must be done solo, and then there's a report. So in the report, um, you're going to submit the final code, as well as a written report. The written report is only a few pages. It's basically just running the thing and saying what you've done. So I'm not going to go through and read all of the things that I've done here. That's pretty boring. But it's just a basic report on what you've done. Now, again, there's a reason I haven't made this mandatory, because I think you know, with a midterm and a final and all the assignments, that would be a bit much. So just keep in mind that if it does seem like, OK, I don't want to do that, you absolutely don't have to do that. I'm not going to think less of you if you don't do that. And I think in the past, I've, in the last two years that I've offered the bonus project, I think I get five or less, five or fewer students who typically do the project. And of those five, it's, most of them are usually like really close to that 65 who just want to make their, their mark better.